welcome to the 2020 Dissertation Showcase. This is truly an exciting occasion, a celebration of remarkable achievements by extraordinary students. This is our third annual Dissertation Showcase. I was at last year's, so I know what's in store for you. It's a marvelous time to celebrate excellence and to be inspired and hopeful about the future. Now, I was a graduate student but a long time ago, and one of my professors was an editor of an academic journal. He asked us in the course of the semester to write three 20-page papers. These were technical, quite technical, and specialized. Once we submitted those papers, he said, now I want you to take that 20-page paper and reduce it to one page a page that is very clear in explaining what you're saying and could be understood by anyone who's not a specialist in your field. Now that was a daunting task, but the task that we are asking our students to do, to take the years of work in a laboratory or the years of poring over manuscripts and archives or the hundreds of pages of data and analysis they've collected and to put that all into three minutes that is truly a daunting task. Now, completing a doctorate always has hurdles, but this year offered our graduates unanticipated challenges. But, as you would expect, they rose to the occasion defending on Zoom, interviewing remotely, and, of course, taking part today in this dissertation showcase. We have six presenters. They come from disciplines across our 30 fields of study, from biology to urban education. Our six presenters focus on big subjects, democracy, technology, equality, the environment, their skills in research, writing, and teaching, their ability to think critically and collaboratively across the disciplines, their understanding of the importance of bringing their work forward to address our most depressing problems today are more important than ever. Presentation jewel here from our students today exemplify what we aim to do at the Graduate Center, which is to educate for the public good. So now, let's enjoy the showcase. And our first speaker is Brandon Del Pozo. I spent 23 years as a police officer, 19 of them in the New York City Police Department. It was one night after policing an Occupy Wall Street protest that I decided to write my doctoral dissertation on what it means to police a democracy. It was a rowdy big protest. There were arrests made. I thought we could have done a better job, and I realized that policing had to get this right if it wanted to live up to its democratic ideals. There's a long, rich history in political philosophy a lot of it dominated by Professor John Rawls, who wrote a theory of justice, who's perhaps the most predominant thinker in 20th century political philosophy. But he's not without his critics. Charles Mills, Elizabeth Anderson, Derek Darby, and George Yancey, to some extent, all felt that when it came to the questions of justice that we deal with about poverty, class, race, oppression, the political philosophy was pretty inert. So one of the things I wanted to do was take one of the biggest questions in a democracy and its lived experience, which is how we should police it and apply political philosophy to see what guidance it could give us as a pathway towards innovation and reform. And I wanted to be conscious of the critics because I think they made a good point. One of the first things I did was come up with the three duties of the police in a democracy. The first is to protect and rescue citizens. It doesn't make any difference if they're guilty or innocent. The job is to make life sacred and to protect and rescue people as a matter of the government's duty is not only democratic, it's what separates the state from nature. So the police have to get that right and in a way that respects life, no matter what the situation demands. The second thing that the police do in this democracy is broker and enforce the fair terms of cooperation in public spaces, whether it's about using a park or a sidewalk, whether it's about protesting or commuting whether it's about traffic safety, whether it's about religious observance, whether it's about free speech, public spaces are relatively scarce when people are competing to use them. And it's the police that have to decide 
what the fair use is and what the safe use is. And they have to be agnostic about what people's conceptions of the good are, whether you're from whatever religion, whether you're pursuing whatever conception of the good, whether you're protesting something that's unpopular, fairly using public space is about the root of a democracy and it by default falls to the police to make those judgments. The third thing the police do is they bring people and evidence to the court to adjudicate issues of criminal guilt. That's the one we all think of. That's the one that's been overemphasized. And that's the one that its emphasis has led us to a lot of the situations that we're in now. But it's really getting the other two right and properly justifying them that make a democracy what it is. So one thing I was able to take from the work of John Rawls is the idea of public reason. He hadn't applied it to policing, but I think it, it does lend itself to, to, to that application. And that's that when you're justifying the coercive force of a government, you have to rely on reasons that treat all citizens as equals. Those reasons can't privilege a particular religion. They can't privilege a particular conception of the good. They can't privilege a particular class. But the other thing that's critical, if you're offering these reasons in terms of equality, is they can't just privilege the democratic majority. They can't just privilege the populist sentiment that maybe brought an elected official to power and that it brought the police to their positions. So ironically, one of the things that Rawlsian public reason calls for in democracy is not only democratic accountability, but supplying reasons that protect vulnerable populations from the imperfections of a democracy. It can't just be that we police the way the majority wants. It can't just be that we police the way a populist sentiment demands. It means that we protect right and offer reasons that treat citizens as equals, even the most unpopular citizens, even the most vulnerable citizens, even the most, even the citizens that have the least voice. I think that that's an important uh, aspect of public reason that really helps shape policing a democracy. So if we expect policing to be done right, if we expect citizens to have their rights protected, then we have to make it clear what policing owes citizens. And I think political philosophy has something to contribute in that regard. If we take the concerns of the more radical philosophers and we reconcile them with what John Rawls told us about the nature of public reason and a democracy. Thank you. I'll now turn it over to Allison Walls in theater and performance. Picture Anna, encircled by Siamese children in The King and I. Picture Maria, encircled by Austrian children in The Sound of Music. The similarity of these images, a woman surrounded by children to whom she is not technically related, struck me as more than mere coincidence. Indeed, attractive and vibrant heroines who act as mothers to children not biologically theirs take center stage in a phenomenal number of US plays, films, and musicals from 1939 to the early 1960s. The prevalence in this era of adoptive mothers, stepmothers, nannies, and governesses suggested profound cultural resonance. I wanted to know why. Honestly, I never imagined this would be my dissertation when I came to the Graduate Center. An actor who doesn't sing I was a little snobbish about musicals, but a class with David Severin changed my mind. I was drawn to the way popular performance like the Broadway musical provides a sentimental investment in the social and political changes of their moment. This too is what compelled me in my investigation of the surrogate mother, as I call this character. And so, having narrowed a long list of possible case studies to nine, I dove into US history, adoption, World War II and the Cold War, and diverse theoretical fields. I explored political speeches, reviews, production photos and documents, interviews and magazine, magazine puff pieces, and gingerly turned the pages of one fan's old scrapbook in the Billy Rose Theatre Archives at the New York Public Library. The connections were abundant. The mid-20th century is an era preoccupied with the domestic dream. But emotional, not biological bonds were reconceived as the key to family. With increasing desire and decreasing stigma, adoption rates soared. World War II prompted a rejection of eugenics, now too closely tied to Nazism, though popular just decades before. 
In a global turn, charities urged Americans to adopt a child from communist-ravaged nations. Pearl Buck's Welcome House, founded in 1949 to facilitate adoptions of Amerasian children, literalized the metaphor. Buck filled a genuine need, but also hoped these adoptees would provide a tie between the US and Asia. The Welcome House's strongest supporter was Oscar Hammerstein, author of The King and I, a musical centered on an Americanized governess becoming surrogate mother to Asian children. Buck and Hammerstein's friendship is a satisfyingly concrete connection that highlights the far-reaching significance of the surrogate mother's reformulation of what it means to be a family and what it means to be American, from the nuclear family to the nuclear threat. But as my analysis shows, it is far from a sole example. The surrogate mother is both cultural product and cultural agent. Through her free-spirited liberalism and maternal embrace of children genetically removed from her, this popular heroine destigmatizes mixed and unconventional families, offers an image of womanhood that is both feminine and independent, and critiques prejudice within the US, but also advances a type of maternal imperialism, offering a sentimental frame for US military expansion, particularly in Southeast Asia. The surrogate mother and her descendants in several recent TV shows that celebrate the chosen family make the myth that America has always been, at its heart, a proudly mongrel nation feel natural. Her effectiveness is evidenced in the shock now felt at the return of eugenicist tropes and an at once isolationist and combative foreign policy. These popular works are integral to an important cultural turn, not only in the emergence of a new, now iconic character, but with how that character, by redefining the US vision of family, redefined also the US vision of itself. Now I'd like to turn it over to Robert Robinson from Urban Education. Four years ago, when my friend told me to attend a Women in the Black Panther Party event at the Schomburg Center for Research on Black Culture, I actually had no idea that I would be finding the foundation of my dissertation project. That evening, I had the opportunity to hear Erica Huggins discuss her role as the director of the Oakland Community School, the Black Panther Party's full-time day school that operated from 1973 until 1982. So I packed my bags and went off to California to engage in my first ever archival research experience at Stanford University and the African American Museum and Library at Oakland. As I searched through old school documents, photos, and newspapers, I found a wealth of resources that discussed that the school started in the 1970s in its first iteration, one of three, and the Oakland Community School was the most celebrated of these three. Now, while the Oakland Unified School District struggled to provide fair education for its students, the Black Panther School actually provided equitable education through the use of fundraising, federal dollars, and tuition. In fact, the California Department of Education lauded the school as a model school of its time um, after students tested two and three levels above grade level in reading and mathematics. Sadly, though, in 1982, the Black Panther Party's closure led to the closure of the school and families who had found food, healthcare resources, and a number of other things within this school and community resource center were now forced to navigate the unequal terrain of Oakland politics and the broader Alameda County. Now the title of this dissertation, Still in the Meeting, comes from an old literacy practice during enslavement where free black folks would sneak onto the plantation to teach enslaved black folks how to read and write. And the tradition continued throughout the 20th century through black independent schools. Uh, now the Oakland community, serves, serves, uh, Oakland community School serves as a prime example of this tradition as it, uh, it holds up the, the affirmation of students' cultural backgrounds, it reinforces their critical thinking skills, and it awakens their political consciousness. 
So long before many of the celebrated different types of educational theories came to the forefront of education today, the Black Panther Party was already practicing them with students ages 2 to 12. Now, from my multiple trips to California, Atlanta University Center, Emory, and the Schomburg Center, I found a number of documents that included, you know, old school planning guides, uh, newspapers, including the Black Panther newspaper, and a number of yearbooks from the school. But I also had the opportunity to engage in oral histories with former students, staff, and teachers of the school. And in the dissertation, I weave together archival documents and community voices to tell the story of a rich school and resource center that provided high quality education for students of color. Uh, oral history, though, is at the heart of my work as it creates an opportunity for us to see the lived experiences of teachers and students, their recollections from their Oakland community school years and the years after provide an opportunity to see what made the school so remarkable. Uh, they also uncovered the hidden tensions of the Black Panther Party that led to its eventual collapse and thus the closure of the school. So by re-engaging with the history of the Oakland Community School, we have an opportunity to dream of education anew that both affirms students' cultural and social backgrounds and gives them an opportunity to push through to see the endless possibilities in education. Thank you for your time. Now I'd like to turn it over to Cecilia Cardona, in biology and plant sciences. Growing up in Colombia, a neotropical country, I was always fascinated by the diversity of plant forms surrounding my childhood home. My curiosity about plant life has stayed with me for all of my life. And I was struck when I moved to New York to discover that one of the most common species here, Ginkgo biloba, which is planted all over Fifth Avenue, hasn't changed in more than 300 million years. It is what scientists call a living fossil. But what has allowed Ginkgo to thrive for such a long expanse of time? And what makes a Ginkgo seed so different from a tomato seed or a mustard seed? My research is focused on the genes involved in seed formation in order to better understand the diversity of seed shapes and how these are formed. It turns out that plants with seeds appeared over 300 million years ago, even before dinosaurs, and they continue to thrive long after their extinction. Indeed, seed plants not only survived, but they also became the most abundant plant lineage on Earth. My research is focused on the seeds of this living fossil, Ginkgo biloba, and the genes involved in its formation, specifically those involved in a particular and crucial part of the seed, the seed coat. The seed coat protects the embryo and keeps it vital for long periods so that a new life cycle begins again for a new plant. To understand these developmental processes, scientists have developed systems used as models. So similar to how in animals, eh, mice and fruit flies are often used as models, in plant studies, Arabidopsis is the model species, which belongs to the mustard family. Studies in Arabidopsis reveal the genes involved in seed formation. So taking as reference those genes that we already know I began to search them in other species with very different seed morphologies, like ginkgo, the yew tree, and two different ephedra species, one with fleshy seeds and the other one with dry seeds. My initial research into those specific genes has left me with more questions than answers, as the genetics behind the seed is very complex and it doesn't seem to be uniform across all seed plants. So I decided to take a different approach. Instead of using Arabidopsis as a research starting point, I began to search for the specific genes in the species of interest for my research. To achieve this goal, I sequenced separately the different parts of the seed in order to try to find the genes, the, the specific gene sequences that make the singularity of these uh, seeds. As the climate evolves at a speed faster than expected, plants will have to adapt. Most likely, seeds will have to germinate and grow under very harsh, harsh conditions on dry and nutrient-poor soils. Understanding the basis of seed development 
will not only be very satisfactory for the simple pleasure of knowledge, pleasure that nourish all scientists, but it would also provide us with the framework for successfully troubleshoot many of the problems that we're already facing due to climate change. Now, I would like to turn it over to Ilya Nayshevsky from the chemistry program. How many of you are concerned about our environment? I am. That's why I have decided to focus my doctorate research to study the ways to improve the efficiency of solar panels in order to mitigate the effects of climate change. And I have looked at nature for my inspiration to do so. Solar power has been celebrated as a key solution to our contemporary environmental crisis. It is a clean and renewable resource Yet, very few of us realize the inhibiting factors plaguing the solar power industry, their efficiency. Solar power is generated by the photovoltaic effect, where photo means light and voltaic means electricity. Ever since the inception of photovoltaic energy, scientists have worked to create more efficient solar panels. Most of these efforts have focused on creating a more efficient solar cell and not focused on the other components of solar panels. However, in recent increased use of solar panels, new inhibiting factors have emerged. Surface reflections and environmental soiling, which both decrease the amount of power generated by the panels. Surface reflections occur when sunlight gets reflected from the surface of the protective glass covering the solar panel. This reflection allows light to bounce off from the surface of the glass Therefore, the light never reaches the solar cell underneath. We can observe this effect as glare. Another problem is environmental soiling, where dust, pollen, and other aerosols get deposited on the surface of solar panel glass and block the light from reaching the solar cell underneath. This is a very costly problem, especially in dry, sun-drenched environments where solar power makes the most sense to people. In nature, we find structures that can allow more light to pass through the transparent objects, such as moth's eye. And we also find structures that can promote self-cleaning, such as a lotus leaf. These structures are called anti-reflective and anti-soiling. They are also super hydrophobic, which means they repel water. We have engineered a super hydrophobic glass coating that mimics the chemistry and structure of moth eye and the lotus leaf. By placing these coatings on the surface of solar panel glass, we can allow more light to pass through the glass and we can allow the glass to be cleaned all by itself. To achieve my goals, we engineered glass coating fabrication techniques, designed and constructed glass reliability experiments, built analytical lab equipment, and implemented computer modeling. This has allowed us to formulate a working theory and to test the practical application of this technology. The most important contribution to science stemming from my research was the discovery of a novel anti-soiling me method that occurs on these super hydrophobic surfaces. This work has been published in many journals and has been presented in many uh, conferences. Furthermore, we were able to advance our research and create a smart coating that is able to collect water from air and use it to clean the glass. This work has been uh, designed to mimic the effects observed on a Namib desert beetle, and it has shown to be very effective in dry and arid environments to promote cleaning of the glass. In the end, my research has contributed to create a more efficient solar panel and has gotten us a step closer to tackling our environmental crisis. Now, I would like to turn over to Amanda Sanseverino from the business program. Corruption is a huge global problem with detrimental economic and social effects. Many countries are now passing tougher anti-corruption laws. What these laws do is ban companies from bribing public officials in foreign countries in order to gain an advantage over their competitors. But do these laws really lead to less corruption? 
It turns out this question doesn't have a straightforward answer. Before entering the PhD program, I specialized in the taxation of complex business entities with operations across the globe. At the time, I in no way imagined I'd spend years researching potential corruption by such entities. What led me down this road was an article in the Wall Street Journal. The article highlighted how multinational companies might structure deals in all kinds of sophisticated ways in order to skirt anti-corruption scrutiny. This was the impetus for my dissertation, which focuses on a law called the UK Bribery Act. A little about the UK Bribery Act. It was adopted in 2010 in the United Kingdom, and it's well recognized now as one of the strictest anti-corruption laws in the world. One feature that sets this law apart is its extraterritorial jurisdiction. What that means is it applies not just to companies based in the UK, but also to companies based in other countries, as long as those companies do business in the UK. This is important because extraterritorial jurisdiction is perceived to be key in prosecuting multinational companies, which are major contributors to corruption. In my study, I compared the UK Bribery Act's effect on two groups of multinational companies based in the United States. The first group consists of companies plausibly exposed to the law's jurisdiction because they conduct material business in the UK. The second group consists of companies not plausibly exposed. In general, there are a host of empirical challenges in identifying a research design to credibly examine the impact of an anti-corruption law. A benefit of focusing on extraterritorial jurisdiction is that it allowed me to compare the law's effect on exposed US companies with the law's effect on other US companies. What this setting does is alleviate some of the empirical issues faced in cross-country studies, which dominate the literature. The way I measure companies' exposure to corrupt countries is based on Transparency International's Corruption Perceptions Index. My main finding suggests that US companies exposed to the UK Bribery Act curb their business in countries perceived to be corrupt relative to similar unexposed US companies. Now, these companies were already subject to the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, which is the primary anti-corruption law in the US. So my findings suggest that the extraterritorial application of foreign anti-corruption laws plays an incremental role in curbing bribery by US multinational companies. This evidence is timely because globalization has led to the increasing prevalence of extraterritorial jurisdiction in laws targeting cross-border issues. Understanding more about the impact of laws with extraterritorial reach is important for several reasons. For example, whether one country should impose its legal system on other countries in this way is an issue of debate. One goal of my dissertation is to help inform this conversation. Of course, my study cannot speak to the overall net benefit or cost of extraterritorial jurisdiction. However, its findings suggest one benefit, curbing corruption in U.S. multinational companies. These findings bring us closer to understanding just how to address the corruption problem. Thank you. Wow, what an inspiration to hear these fine crafted presentations and to celebrate their accomplishments. I think you can see why I am so proud to be the interim president of this great institution. And I wanna to say to the six of you, it's clear you are brilliantly equipped to deal with whatever comes your way. You've demonstrated your talent and your perseverance. We wish you all the greatest success. Now, continuing and completing a doctorate takes a lot of time, resolve, and snacks. At times, it's a lonely road, but no one achieves what you six and all your classmates, those graduating with you today, have achieved in isolation because it takes a community, a community composed of the faculty, the library staff, those who helped you with financial aid, those who kept the place clean and safe those who stood by you when your graduate work was driving you crazy, or when you weren't even sure whether you wanted to continue. 
You want to express your thanks to those who stood with you when you celebrated acing an exam and when you made major breakthroughs in your research. To all of them, our heartfelt thanks. And thanks to all of you who've joined us in this celebration. Let's toast our presenters and everyone who helped them along the way. Godspeed.